talk tonight about microservices and um, the cloud-based future of integration. Uh, my name is Charles Young. Uh, I'm the principal consultant to Solve Software Apply. Uh, uh, we are a software uh, development uh, house with uh, well over a decade's experience of integration on, platform, on the Microsoft platform. I joined the company um, around about uh, 2003, the end of 2003, to uh, really be involved with what was then a, a brand new version of BizTalk that Microsoft would just bring to the to the market. Um, the talk tonight, just to give some idea of the agenda, really I want to cover quite a lot of, of ground in terms of going this, so I'll, I'll, I'll be going at a fair lick uh, with the hopes of getting through the material and then um, giving a chance for questions, and I know the uh, uh, any questions that are being asked are being collated. But I want to look um, broadly at integration, just to kick things off, just uh, talk about integration, my understanding of integration, where I'm coming from as far as that's concerned, just make sure that we're on the uh, uh, the same, uh, or seeing from the same hymn sheet as far as that's concerned, but then really talk about integration trends, and some of the things which are happening in the integration space, and some of the uh, trends which are affecting integration and and which are really set to change all of our lives so all of us who are involved in integration on a daily basis and specifically I want to look at microservices and the impact that microservices and microservice think thinking is having on the world of integration and uh, so that will take a little bit of explanation because uh, I suspect that not everybody on the call will be that familiar with the notion of services and I think we need to spend a bit of time looking at that then to see specifically how Microsoft services are impacting the world of platform as a service and by that stage we'll be about ready to talk about what this all means as far as integration is concerned and what's um, what's really coming at us and coming down the line so it's very much um, a quite a broad uh, talk in those kind of areas so I'll kick off with just generally talking about integration. My interest in integration tends to be very much around the, the uh, first of the blobs on the screen around uh, enterprise application integration. I've spent an awful lot of my life now, well, an awful lot of my life last uh, 10, 12 years being involved quite deeply in, in projects where uh, we integrate all kinds of different systems and applications and services. But it's worthwhile just saying that integration is, is a lot wider than that. This is a very typical traditional way of looking at integration, EAI, electronic data integration. EAI is very much uh, adaptation and mediation between different systems and transformation and routing and orchestration. EDI very much focused on, on business to business integration. Uh, uh, it uh, concerns the number of standards, any fat trader comms here on this side of the Atlantic and, and various, uh, uh, various associated standards. And then data integration, which is ETL and data warehousing and all kinds of things um, concerned that. Some people call this um, uh, uh, enterprise information integration or EII just to, uh, to, keep, it, to keep the three letter acronym going. Uh, that's fantastic. As I say, I'm particularly focused on EAI, which is very much a matter of working with our customers, working with organizations to ensure that all kinds of systems and applications that were never designed to share information, never designed to collaborate, never designed uh, to talk to each other, that they can talk to each other effectively. Um, uh, as, as part of supporting that organization, what that organization is doing. And so the traditional way around this is a hub, and we have some kind of messaging hub, uh, some kind of middleware approach, which deals with and provides the tools, and the platform, and the management for adaptation, and mediation of messages as they pass between different systems, and orchestrating the, the interchange between those different systems. So I've lived in that space for a long time, and that tends to be the way that I look at the world. Um, pretty much um, about the time I was starting, uh, there was quite a push uh, around service buses, and I think it's worthwhile just putting a slide or two about the service bus approach. Service buses have always been very associated with integration, and many of the service bus tools are really integration tools. But the service bus approach is slightly different in that um, it is very much an embodiment of service orientated architecture, and very purposely, purposely um, uh, designed to be that. Uh, the bus is um, always a problem to describe. What do we mean by the bus? But what I would mean by a bus is 
really a ubiquitous set of services which services can can just um, hook into and make use of as they need uh, as, as they need to and um, many of those services may to be to do with integration or with communication between different services or between services in the outside world but the bus is really about providing a whole set of functionality and that's normally done through some kind of container mechanism all the services reside in a container the container looks after all kinds of different uh, concerns it tends to give us this sense of things being on the bus or off the bus and if they're on the bus we can think of them almost as being sort of guarded by the bus but there are always some services whose job it is to integrate and to talk to the outside world so we start to get this idea of inside and out and this notion of on-ramp services and off-ramp services which really adapt and mediate and route between the outside world and, and what's happening on the bus so if we kind of just redraw that rather like the first slide um we get up something like this there's our bus we've got as i say internal services and sort of services facing the outside world and dealing with integration requirements we can see this very definite sense of the inside and the outside and uh, i want to come back to that in just uh, just a minute or two so really um as our way into microservices this is really an architectural question i need to talk a little bit about architecture uh, before before getting on to microservices and I would hope that most people on the call are pretty familiar with the diagram that I've got um, uh, up here. We have been dealing with layered architectures for almost as long as I can remember now. Certainly uh, for me, somewhere somewhere in the mid 1990s, really sort of coming across the idea of th three tier architecture and multi tier architecture and, and layered approaches. And we've been using that ever since. I, I lose count of the number of times that I've drawn architectural diagrams that basically follow what I have on the screen there, presentation, business logic, data and integration, perhaps uh, uh, in that uh, layer at the bottom. And that's fine. And um, from the point of view of an integration person, I'm uh, obviously thinking about, well, how does this fit in with all the different applications and systems and services and platforms that we need to integrate with? And if I'm drawing diagrams, I draw diagrams like this, as many people do, and I, I have everything linked up, and, and, and that's fine, and that's all dandy, and we kind of understand this approach, this layered approach to architecture. But there are problems with it. One problem is really around integration, which is that, well, you know, there's a data layer, and very often I see people say, well, that's also the integration layer, because somehow that talking to other systems is about data as well, so maybe it belongs down there. But in reality, integration also belongs just as much at the presentations here because there we're integrating maybe with channels and uh, uh you know people i don't know calling up a call center or something like that and they might have several different ways in and we're integrating all of that to, to to the business logic so integration kind of kind of crosses the piece as it were and the led architecture approach doesn't exactly capture what's going on what's really going on is that there's a boundary there's a boundary around our business logic and that boundary is a mediation boundary. It's the boundary where uh, we protect our business logic and the investment that we make, and we talk to the outside world. And when I say talk to the outside world, that might be as simple as mediating to uh, an MVC-based web application, or passing uh, DTOs across that boundary, or it may be as complex as uh, full-on mediation with all kinds of different applications, talking all kinds of different protocols, or, or whatever it may be. So lots and lots of different approaches to mediation but they happen at the boundary primarily around our business logic and this is quite a nice link to an architectural approach which is at the center of microservices and which i think is is really useful from an integration point of view and really useful as a hook to understand what i've got coming up in the rest of this presentation and that idea is the idea of hexagonal architecture this was um basically put together by a gentleman called Alistair Coburn. Uh, he was one of the um, original people who wrote the Agile Manifesto, and uh, he's made uh, some quite uh, serious contributions over the years to the whole evolution of agility and Agile process. Back in 2005, he was thinking about um, uh, effectively multi-tiered or multi-led architecture and was concerned about the propensity for business logic bleed over the over the boundary for business logic that should be in the middle 
to as it were end up being in the presentations here or in the data here or whatever it was so he he started to rethink this whole approach and he thought about it in terms of an application to me which he drew as a hexagon i'll come back to that in just a moment and a very firm boundary as it were between that application domain the business logic in our application domain and the rest of the world whatever the rest of the world may be let's say that could just be a uh, the website that we're creating or it could be some external application or whatever now there's absolutely nothing to be taken from the fact that this is a hexagon there is no um relevance to the number six but there is relevance to um the there's some fantastic noises here there is some relevance to the fact that um the the around that mediation boundary there are uh, different sides to it as it were those 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 different parts to it and uh, the idea here is that effectively this is the mediation boundary it is where mediation is done alistair coburn saw this in terms of ports and adapters so you can see where I'm going to go on at least one side here with BizTalk, but uh, that's not the, the real point of tonight. But ports and adapters, uh, where the notion of a port, and that's really why he wanted to shape with sides to it, where a port is a kind of logical or even conceptual grouping of adapters because they kind of naturally belong together. They might not have any runtime implementation, but, but they kind of naturally uh, belong to each other and cohere in some way. And they, as it were, house the adapters. The adapters deal with mediation. And we put a lot of emphasis on that layer around the application domain in order to make it very, very clear that the business logic is on the inside and other stuff is on the outside in terms of the way that we are thinking about things, the way that we are doing our architecture. So that's essentially the idea of hexagonal architecture. And I'm going to be coming back to that as I go through the slides. But on the basis of that, I want to start to talk about the changing face of integration, where integration is going, what is happening with integration, and uh, broadly what's going on. So integration has been changing and is changing, I think, quite rapidly in many ways. Firstly, um, just a little bit of a history thing. I'm really struck by the way which uh, certainly enterprise application integration has changed massively over the last um, uh, decade or so, really because of standardization of interfaces. Uh, within uh, the enterprise, behind the firewall, we very often still use SOAP and WSDL. Uh, SOAP with its notion of a, an XML envelope around a payload that's extensible. You can extend it with a number of uh, additional specifications, handle security and addressing and all kinds of other concerns. And we typically use that with WSDL, which really sort of effectively gives us strongly typed interfaces to our services. So it's a uh, a message payload over strongly tight interfaces kind of approach side of this uh, i'm certainly not going to get into the typical soap versus rest argument and i'm really quite sick and tired of of hearing over the years but on the other side of course there's rest which is not really a protocol but it's more an architectural approach and we normally do this over http we we limit ourselves to a bunch of http verbs we use uris to address uh, some notion of resources and service is really our gateway to those resources and we use most importantly we use a hypermedia approach hypermedia as the engine of application state and uh, this this idea I, i'll I, i'm not going to go into all of this for um tonight because it's it's not really the purpose of it but the real purpose of saying this is that by standardizing so much on the interface by the fact that so many applications now today 2015 have a web service interface of some description, whereas 10, 15 years ago, well, 10 years ago, it was actually still quite unusual for third party applications to have a web service inter interface. That has really simplified our job as, as integration people. Still lots of complexity, but it's certainly um, uh, tended to simplify things, although we still face a lot of noises off, uh, still a lot of uh, things that we, we have to deal with uh, in terms of integration in the real world. Another thing which is really kind of changing the world is obviously the cloud and particularly cloud service, cloud service integration, where we're seeing um, a, a definite move now towards services which are hosted in the cloud, which are easily accessible, and you can just go out there and, and sign up and, and start using those. Um, I, I help my wife run her business, and uh, you know we, we're just using a, a cloud-based accounting package. If we're just uh, up to five users, completely free of charge. And you know, I write bits of code to integrate with that, and uh, just through a RESTful um, interface, and uh, do various things with it. And 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 it's uh, 
uh, all fantastic. So there's a lot of this happening and we can see that trend. We can see that trend really extending out as uh, really quite serious offerings uh, make their advent on the cloud as typically RESTful services uh, hosted. Uh, in the cloud in that way. Mobile application integration, another thing which is sort of changing our, our life. A, a number of um, uh, projects that we've uh, undertaken in the last two or three years have had a mobile aspect to them, handheld devices, um, uh, maybe reaching out to mobile phones in, uh, in our case, uh, because of the nature of what we do, uh, probably less on, on that score, but certainly mobility being a really important part of what we're doing and integrating those devices with uh, the everything else that's happening on the cloud or uh, behind the scenes. And then um, the Internet of Things, which is is uh, very much uh, the, uh, the thing of the moment. And uh, so much being said about this as we see more and more uh, devices becoming Internet enabled, sharing their data. We're seeing uh, the collection of large um, sets of data and events. Uh, we're seeing the, the move to open data, uh, particularly in the public sector. We're seeing a real move to that now. So that uh, being, a, being able to combine either uh, uh, real-time event streams or, or data that's been captured um, from the Internet of Things and being able to, to use that in the mix, as it were, and to integrate with all of that is another thing which is really changing our lives. So one of the things which has been happening over the last couple of years in relation all of this is the explosion of integration platform as a service, iPads. iPads is a term that Gartner came up with uh, in 2011, a little bit controversial at the time because um, they, they uh, basically seemed to see iPads as just a huge, great big shopping list of enterprise level functionality, uh, sort of web sphere in the cloud, basically, if I can put it like that, and uh, took, it took quite a bit of um, uh, quite a bit of criticism as a result of that, but the term has stuck. And since 2011, and Gartner bring out this term, since that time, we, we've seen an explosion of uh, new iPads offerings. Just before Christmas, I was doing some research on this and went through. I had no problem, admittedly partly thanks to a Wikipedia page, which was a great help, um, which somebody's obviously maintaining, but I still had no problem in finding, I don't know, 45 different iPads vendors without breaking a sweat. And I'm sure there's probably as many again to actually discover out there. So there's a lot of iPads vendors who've entered the market and who are offering integration tools um, hosted in the cloud and very easily accessible. And uh, they are designed for integration and for integrating with both the cloud um, in terms of software as a service, mo mobile devices, internet things, and on-premises systems as well. So a lot going on there. Um, iPad systems are um, quite varied and uh, it's it's difficult. One can only generalize about them. So um, if there are any, any iPads vendors on the call, I, I apologize if I misrepresent your, um, uh, your, your, your technology in any way, but that's not the point. Um, I'm kind of generalizing and anything I say should be taken as just a pure generalization. But we're talking about um, uh, very often, um, quite an emphasis on connectors, and uh, we tend to get a little bit into uh, sort of connectors bingo, as it were. You know, I got more connectors than you. I think the the, the biggest uh, number of connectors claimed uh, that I've seen so far was 2,400 uh, by one vendor, but um, uh, most vendors are sort of more like 150 connectors or 200 connectors, something like that, as part of that. So lots of connectors for lots of different things. And then mediation facilities and workflow um, uh, as part of all of that. And of course, uh, an iPads will be hosted on the cloud. It'll be elastic. It'll be highly available. There'll be no capital expenditure, uh, usage based direct cost model, pay for what you use. And sometimes not, not right away across the piece at all, but for several, especially the new, the, the sort of cloud only entrance here, uh, then this will be um, browser based tools. Quite a few of the vendors have hybrid support for hybrid models. Uh, in some cases, that might be because their iPads technology is either a companion to or effectively a port of an on-premises EAI server or, or service bus. Uh, in other cases, these might be more lightweight agents that you can um, implement on-premises and can uh, basically do some adaptation locally and then talk up to the iPads in the cloud. Quite a few um, vendors offer that, not all, but uh, quite, quite a lot do. 
And another thing, especially for those vendors who've already got um, a big investment in on-premises integration stuff, is, is the degree of fidelity, the ability to take a workload that you've got running on-premises and perhaps just move it, just lift and shift, as it were, up to the corresponding iPads uh, technology, uh, if that exists. And that obviously some vendors um, have very high fidelity, some have much lower fidelity, some are just purely cloud only. So quite a lot of um, variation, but um, we really want to look at this from the point of view of aspirations, and that will take us into microservices, and really the sort of aspirations that people have in the integration space, but also much, much more broadly than just integration. So one of these is a really problematic term, simplicity. Everyone wants things to be simple, simple and straightforward. And that, of course, I say is problematic because there's such a notion as inherent uh, um, uh, complexity, which is kind of something you can't get rid of. But obviously, the aspiration is that the tools, the technologies, the approaches, the architectures, all of this kind of stuff will really lend itself to um, maximizing a simple, straightforward approach wherever possible. We want velocity uh, because we're living not only on internet time, we're living on cloud internet time. And, and this is just getting ridiculous in terms of the kind of velocity um, of development, which uh, now is expected. And uh, so uh, huge amounts of uh, issues around that. And of course, you know, the whole agility thing uh, has been about that. And the, uh, the whole DevOps thing is about that. And then the microservices is about that. Um, the, the ability to evolve what we're doing very, very quickly and rapidly uh, and uh, to be able to, especially with cloud services, to be able to really cycle very quickly through, through different versions. The desire to democratize, this, this really sort of fits in with things like simplicity, but it's more than that. And it's a very much a, a feature of the cloud, this idea that in the cloud, we really don't want to lock people into proprietary and complex technologies. We want to ensure that the tools and the frameworks are those which are as familiar as possible to as wide a group of developers as possible so that everybody can play in the sandpit. Everybody's got a chance to, 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 to uh, do whatever it is and to, to play with the technology and to exploit the technology that's actually there. Um, and um, ultimately cost reduction, of course, with the cloud, we're always looking to reduce costs. So this brings us in really to microservices and uh, the notion of microservices. I'm betting that some people will be very familiar with this and other people may not even have heard of the, the term before. So I'll spend a couple of minutes just going through the idea of microservices. Microservices are very heavily associated with the notions of hexagonal architecture. And if you read about microservices, you'll find um, that many, many people will um, start their uh, uh, there's a rendition of what Microsoft is about by, by relating this to hexagonal architecture. And hexagonal architecture has really had quite an impact on microservice thinking. And so one aspect of that is that um, microservices, which as you can guess, the idea is small services or fine grain services, um, we're really looking at sort of what happens in the center, in the middle, on the inside of hexagonal architecture. Uh, this is primarily where the focus of, of microservices is, which means that, of course, um, in the wider sense, there's still a need for all that mediation uh, and adaptation, all that integration with a, ver a wide variety of other systems and applications and, and services. But microservices really focuses on the inside of the hexagon. If I just go back to a layered architecture for a moment and just use this as a, a hook for just going through microservice principles, the kind of everyone's got a slightly different take on exactly what the microservice principles are. But broadly speaking, uh, we start off with the idea of breaking the monolith. This idea that too often um, what we're building is too monolithic. Monolithic maybe in terms of a big lump of, of, of code, but also monolithic in terms of um, lots and lots of stuff that has to be deployed together and just simply won't work unless it's deployed together. Uh, that, that, that kind of idea and various other aspects of, of monolithic approaches. So the idea is to go for a very fine grained approach to the way in which we create services, we create lots of services and make sure that those services do one thing and do it well and that they can really easily uh, communicate and, and be composed with other services in order to provide solutions. So it's very much an emphasis on that. It's an emphasis on organizing development teams 
around business capabilities. This sort of comes from the agile world and, and that kind of approach. This idea that we avoid horizontal layering of functionality in terms of the way that we, we, we put teams together. So we don't have functional teams that are dealing with a horizontal layer of functionality, but rather sort of more vertical teams, um, which, which cross from top to bottom and which um, basically work with the business and are multidisciplinary and are looking sort of end to end in that kind of way, organizing around business capabilities. This idea that services should be able to be deployed, hosted and versioned independently. If necessary, we should be able to take every service and host it in its own process. People take this, as we'll see on the next slide, too literally sometimes and think that's the uh, sort of mandated almost by microservices. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But the point is our, our services should be built for, for this. Why? Well, because um, this kind of approach really helps in terms of the evolution of our software and allow us to, allows us to more easily and more rapidly uh, respond to change. And uh, using lightweight communication, the real point of this is on the inside, in terms of the microservices, do not depend on some container technology to handle the communication and interchange between your microservices. You may need to depend on um, technology for talking to the outside world, maybe. We'll talk about that, of course. Um, but between your microservices, no container needed. And typically, this means you know lots of REST and, and that kind of stuff, RESTful interfaces, and uh, avoiding that. Why? Well, because if you have a container, you've got a big dependency on it, and therefore, you're kind of locked into that technology in the way that your microservices work, and you can't uh, version uh, and evolve them uh, as easily, and, and various other drawbacks as well. And, and part of that drawback is the avoidance of centralized governance and management, and this idea that really again rather um like the democratization idea in the cloud that that we should avoid dictating what tools and technologies have to be used we should allow different maybe small development teams uh, to decide for themselves but still be able to take what they have and use it alongside the output from other teams as necessary and integrate it with that as necessary so these are microservice principles. I say not to be taken too literally in every situation. Um, you can get into problems. Um, I'll leave you to follow that link at, at some point, but it'll take you to a great um, uh, warts and all uh, sort of story about uh, you know how microservices can quite easily go wrong. Guy who was uh, called in to to look at a system with 25 different services where. Um, every instance of, of a business process traversed, or pretty much everyone traversed all 25, um, all 25 of those services. And um, so that was great. They, they, stuck, um, they stuck all this code onto a single box initially, uh, each one a separate process, each one running in Java. So there was uh, 25 instances of JVM on that machine, then they scaled it with a load balance. So they scaled and scaled, and they scaled as much as they um, needed to, to, to manage the kind of throughput. And they got up to 16 virtual machines running 400 instances of, of Java virtual machines, each one with you know, each of these 25 services. And strangely enough, this wasn't performing so well. And they had issues, um, uh, if I'm between the lines, with um, uh, just, just sort of tracing everything and, and keeping, especially with load balance and the way that was being used. And they, they had a number of issues, as you can well imagine uh, with the application. So uh, anyway, uh, it all came down once it had been rationalized to six virtual machines and 12 Java virtual machine instances, two on each machine, uh, H1 running all 25 services because they were all so cohesive. They all belong together. So it made sense to uh, to host them within a single uh, JVM container in that way. And uh, there's a lot more there. It's, it's a great article. So uh, I commend it to you. So. Just before we start to come back, I just want to sort of look at one or two of the Microsoft technologies from, from this perspective and, and just think about them for a moment in regard to microservices. So firstly, BizTalk Server, um, absolutely, it's like a textbook implementation of hexagonal architecture, um, although, of course, it predates um, Alistair Coben's um, uh, 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 ideas there, but, but it really is um, very close to that with the same te uh, terminology. And um, so we have ports and we have adapters which are composed part of mediation. We have a whole mediation there. Very clear distinction between that and the inside, which is really the orchestration. And we have, we have also this very uh, this one way of communicating between the or, or across the boundary, which is the message box, asynchronous queues, queues and subscriptions, which is the only way that BizTalk supports. All with, of course. 
um, a proprietary tool set. And so I'm not going to go through this in any detail, but we have a fairly sophisticated uh, mediation container for ports with their pipelines and adapters and lots and lots of stuff built in there. And then we go across the message box and we can plug in various components. And then we've got another container at the back end, which is running our orchestrations and that's great. And they can be very fine grained and we can deploy them across different processes independently, uh, except that the licensing of this product is, is very much um, around, you know, sort of um, distribution over a small number of central machines rather than a very widespread uh, distribution. But our orchestration is running in a very sophisticated container which manages the interchange. So we can see that they're aligned. This talk is well aligned with hexagonal architectural thinking. But it, it isn't, and, and quite understandably so. It's not a microservices um, approach, not at all. Um, it's designed for heavy duty enterprise application integration, um, and it's a real workhorse for doing that kind of stuff. Fantastic. OK, so let's think about iPaaS and the iPaaS revolution. Um, there are, of course, all variations, all kinds of variations on the theme. But broadly speaking, the kind of pattern we see again and again is some kind of container hosted in the cloud, very scalable, very elastic. And within that, we put our connectors or adapters. Uh, we uh, have mediation uh, components. So we have uh, flow components. So we build typically some kind of workflow. And then we have some further connection, uh, connectors talking to the outside world. And maybe we can create maps. We normally have them, some kind of mapping uh, schemas, that kind of thing, whatever it may be. We may have the hybrid story. And in some cases, though by no means all, we, we have browser-based tooling. The thing I want you to notice from that is that we have actually quite a monolithic container approach. We put everything in there, mediation. Um, some of the vendors really invite you to think about business logic and, and using these technologies here. And that's fine, but this really is very much not microservices. It's a monolithic approach in which we package everything up and we stick it out in the cloud. On Azure, we have Azure BizTalk services, MABS, um, which is uh, effectively the beginnings of an iPad. We've got a, a bridge, we've got connectors. We don't have full on workflow. We have a sequential workflow called pipelines. And, uh, 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 and uh, we basically do mediation there. And we can plug things into there, including maps and schemas. We've got a hybrid approach. You can host um, uh, WCF adapters on premises. And uh, we use Visual Studio to do all of this. And um, so it's not as wholesome as uh, some of the iPads um, approaches out there. Um, and this takes me really on to the next uh, set of slides by saying that, of course, um, as, as some people on the call will know, we should, um, by rights, according to Plan A, we should have had MABS 2 in preview by now uh, towards the end of last year, which would have been the next evolution of this complete with um, workflow, a very nice separation, actually, between the mediation and the workflow, uh, but still rather monolithic in the way that you um, would have created that in Visual Studio on a single canvas, putting your, your, your connectors, your pipelines, and your, and your workflows all together there. Now, that was canned, and, um, and uh, we're not going down that route. And the reason for that is because of microservices and their impact on platform as a service. So this is what we must look at, and then we will be in a position to talk about microservices for integration. So today, we are aware of platform as a service. We have, um, uh, on Azure, we have a very uh, serviceable um, approach to this. It's a developer story. Developers write code. They uh, use SDKs, and uh, there's there's a fair amount of openness there in terms of what we can use. And they package up their code and configuration, and they send it off, downline, upload it up into Azure. Azure unpacks it. It uh, basically uh, creates diff on top of a couple of golden images it has there, which we call web roles and worker roles, and puts everything together to spin up virtual machines with uh, deployed code on them. And they go up into our presentation tier, and there we go, and we get load balancing, and we can we can build stuff behind the scenes, uh, maybe using worker roles, and we can reconfigure and use that to scale out, and uh, uh, very simply and straightforwardly in live environments, we've got uh, recovery, automatic recovery if it goes down, and we've got lots of very good things. And things to notice from this is the way in which. Developers can just concentrate on their code. They can package their code. It's a, a, a low ceremony approach. They can send it up the line, have it unpackaged, have everything provisioned for them. And the way in which the virtual machine, the, the, the role, um, or the role instance, when it's instantiated, becomes the container 
for that code using the entire virtual machine for the container of that, of that code. This is not the way that we're going to be doing things in future. The thing which is really changing this is another technology called Docker. And again, I would imagine that some people on the call are very familiar with this and other people have not heard of it. If you haven't heard of it, you need to because this will change your life. Um, Docker is, um, is sort of one of those technologies that's come along and taken everyone by surprise because it's just the right kind of blend of this and that for the times. And I think this uh, is something that everyone kind of feels when they first see Docker. So what is Docker? So Docker is starting off with an operating system sitting on top of a kernel. And you run on your, on your operating system, be it a virtual machine or a real machine, the Docker engine. The Docker engine exploits facilities that are deeply embedded in the operating system for containership. And containership is all about virtualizing various resources, like your file system, so that you can now have a process which thinks that it's got exclusive rights to the file system, or it's got an exclusive set of threads, or whatever it may be, all kinds of resources. That's why it needs to be built into the kernel. Windows today does not have this built into the kernel. Linux does, and Docker is today a Linux technology. But bear with me. So um, Docker um, is the engine. It's also a hub, an online hub, which is a repository where you can store um, what are called images, public or private. And there's also local registry support there. So there's uh, um, open source local Docker registries that you can just implement um, uh, on premise. From the Docker hub, you can pull down a base image, it's just a file. Uh, representing uh, the operating system sitting on top of the kernel or an operating system. In the Linux world, you've got quite a, a variation of, of uh, various different distributions of Linux sitting on top of the same kernel. This is really bound by the kernel um, rather than anything else. Obviously, on Windows, we, we talk about a Windows-based image when that comes along. And then you can install uh, binaries and, and libraries on top of that. Um, and there's nice tooling to help you do that. You can use package managers, NuGet, or um, uh, 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 chocolate and all this kind of stuff. You can use all of these kind of tools to uh, to build that and script all of that. You can save your image away into a repository, and then you can build up on that with your application. So every time you 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 sort of were snapshot the image, it's a read only image on which you can then write another layer of um, stuff that you deploy onto that. And it's basically just a diffing file system. So you end up with actually quite a small file typically that represents the container sitting on top of some image. And um, that file is small. It can be easily deployed. It contains perhaps a web service, typically something like that. And when you deploy it and it gets up and running, there it runs on the operating system. And um, if you've got a couple of these containers that share the same binaries, li li libraries, same read-only um, stuff, then, then that's shared. And that could just be pulled down dynamically first time from the hub and then uh, just shared. Um, so you can build that out if you need to. This means that you can install these things in seconds and you can boot um, uh, one of these Docker containers in milliseconds. And uh, you can extend and extend and extend and, and, and do this as you, as you see fit. Um, another um, aspect of this, and you can build up on and you can start to use this for, for, for um, you know, sort of clustering your services and all kinds of things like that. One of the things about this is the tooling. And the tooling, whilst well, part of the Docker magic, is that the tooling is very simple, very straightforward to use. Even developers can use it. You know, you don't have to be, he says, I am a developer. Please don't be offended. Um, so so it, even, even, even people like me can, can, can use it and understand it. Um, especially with, with um, uh, package management and that kind of stuff. Just a few lines of code can be all it takes to actually build up the entire thing. And you can run it and run it again and incorporate that into your build process and automate the whole thing and make it very simple and straightforward. Today, uh, it works on Linux. Tomorrow, it will work on Windows. Microsoft are working with the Docker guys to port all, all of this. They're putting containership into the next version of Windows. There's already some secret source APIs, some of the uh, spotted um, them in Windows 8.1 based on um, uh, some container ship stuff that Microsoft have called um, uh, Drawbridge, which is a code name for a technology that they have and which they use a little bit on Azure. And um, there's much, much more to come and a fulsome port of Docker um, giving us all of that. And that's going to start to fall into place over the next few months. 2016, we think, is the year of Docker. And that's what Gartner was saying uh, just a few days ago. Docker is very much a DevOps technology, um, and uh, it's uh, uh, a very much a situation of pulling in your images from uh, your repository, building those into your 
build scripts and, and build approach. Um, uh, obviously, integrating that with your source code and, and whatever it is, source code management, package uh, management, like I was saying. And uh, then that container, of course, you use it in development, but it just transports everywhere. And that's really the idea of it, is that same container now travels. And you, it's basically a bit like a virtual machine, um, but you tend to use it for a single process or a single service. You can do much more complicated things with it, but that tends to be what you do with Docker. And so you package up your web service, and it's almost like it's in its own virtual machine, but it's a very, very lightweight machine, just a small file that you deploy, and uh, you can ship and run it anywhere. And in the DevOps world, what you're working on development becomes what you actually ship to production after testing to your testing pipeline. So um, that's the case. And Docker, of course, is very platform independent or will be when uh, Windows supports it. Uh, there's there's um, OSX support already and uh, Windows support coming down the line. But also because you just need the Docker engine. So this will run anywhere in the cloud, on different uh, cloud providers, on premises different service providers, whatever it may be. So it is a it is this kind of technology. When you see it, I, mean, I, I saw it and went, ah, oh, right, OK, this, this is the future. Yes, I get this. I understand this. Uh, why is Alistair there? Um, I, that is a mistake. There we go. Comes from working on your slides uh, just before you present. And uh, I don't know why Alistair's name is on there. That's a mistake, so please ignore that. But this is just talking about Docker on Microsoft Azure. And um, talking about, um, if you're not put off by seeing Alistair Coven's name there, um, by uh, talking about today and what's coming down the line. So today, uh, on the IaaS part of Azure, again, isolation security and virtual machines, we can use Docker Engine. It's Linux only. So we're talking about a Linux approach here. But Microsoft have got growing support for this. And uh, that includes a lot of contributions they're making to um, uh, the client tools and the integration of those client tools with the next gen Azure portal. And uh, that includes an Azure driver to make it easier to um, uh, target Azure, uh, PowerShell um, approaches, and support for Docker's open orchestration API, API which they're working on currently. Um, so uh, very, very, very much sort of standard API approach, which they're going to uh, take there. And then also Microsoft have announced, uh, it's not here yet, well, it's beginning to fall into place, but they've announced integration between the Azure Marketplace and the Docker Hub. They've actually got a little bit of that uh, with an Ubuntu uh, Docker image ready to go in the marketplace and further integration with Azure Gallery in the future. And Microsoft are also contributing towards Kubernetes and there's Docker Swarm. These are, these are clustering technologies for clustering um, uh, Docker images. And now we must speculate. Microsoft, we know, are working on Microsoft's, Microsoft's PaaS, their next generation platform as a service. This will be the future of platform as a service on Azure platform. And hopefully we'll see some preview stuff and things beginning to fall into place this year. I suspect 2016 is the year that we will really get underway with this as speculation. But the PaaS platform, obviously, same um, platform as your platform with this isolation security. And we can imagine that Microsoft will provide very robust uh, cluster management uh, exactly how they're going to implement that, we must wait and see, to manage clusters of containers. We know that it's going to be a container-based approach. Do we know it's Docker? Strictly no. Um, that hasn't been announced, so uh, we, we don't know exactly how that's going to turn out. But there's lots of talk about the way in which the containers can uh, be very platform independent, and you can move them here, there, and everywhere, and all kinds of things like that. So clearly, the Docker thinking and the Docker investment that Microsoft are making is a very important part of this. How exactly it's going to work out will become apparent over time. But it will be a container-based Docker-like and quite possibly Docker-based approach. I don't know. And, and it will be that kind of approach with stateful rather than stateless um, uh, containers and various other aspects that Microsoft will be doing. So that's um, where Microsoft are going. The, the next thing really is to talk about Microsoft microservice integration, the last part of the slides that I have here, to really bring this all back then and talk about what this means to integration and where integration is going, what the future is, what our future is going to look like if we're working with integration tools today or involved in integration projects. So the, the point here is that we can say a number of things already. Um, 
including something in Elfish, but um, unfortunately the font hasn't travelled there. Uh, my apologies, a couple of glitches in the slides. But there we go. One thing that we will definitely not be doing in a microservices world, and microservices PaaS world, is that sort of one container to rule them all approach, which we see elsewhere in the integration space. And we sort of see this on premises, and we see this, strangely enough, with the iPads tools, broadly speaking, that we have today, that, you know, come use our technology for all your integration requirements. Everything fits into our container. We'll go and scale your container in the cloud or we'll make your um, uh, container highly available and uh, uh, performant uh, on premises or whatever it may be. This is not the microservices pathway at all. So whatever it is, it won't be that. What I think we will see, what we already have some of, is a notion of hybrid agents. So what I mean by this is really that um, I expect, and I am speculating here, that uh, a part of this will be agents that we can deploy on premises. Uh, we have a lot of that today uh, for adaptation um, in the iPads world, and I suspect that that will evolve um, to, uh, to, to, to basically do a number of other things as well, so that we have containers which we can host on premises which will work really well with what's going on in the cloud but will just basically be easier to use when we're doing enterprise application integration behind the firewall and uh, so that would be something that i would expect to see as a, a really an evolution of what we already have but then if we have those agents we could also run them in the cloud because we could really run anything there and uh, that's going to be an aspect i think of the future paths with this containership model and the really important thing i think about that is just really where i'm coming from which is that when i look at a lot of the the tools that have come along in the last couple of years they're, they're great they're fantastic tools but they are actually somewhat simplistic uh, in many of them not all of them by any means but some of them are um, and and I have complex needs you know as an, as an enterprise application integration person I have complex requirements around batching and transactional control and all the things that people say you should never have to do but in fact you do because I have to integrate with absolutely anything that gets thrown at me I have to be able to do that and this is just you know a sort of list of all the different concerns I could think of around mediation with connectors and then and then a sort of mediation pipeline dealing with transports and sessions presentation application following the OSI model there which is a, a classic way of thinking about mediation and dealing with all of those different concerns and I want a container that at the mediation level can do that when I need it to do that I don't want to be having to write that code myself I really don't so um, that's one aspect, and I think we will see that happening, hopefully, over time. But I think as well at the other end of the spectrum that we will see a real emphasis on mediation microservices, fine-grained services that will just do one thing and do it well, like do a transform or something like that. And that we will see a real emphasis at that other end of the spectrum on being able to use the microservices platform to have mediation microservices as well as the choice uh, or the option to use um, more sophisticated mediation frameworks if we need them. Because small, you know, fine-grained mediation microservices will often do the job and do it more than adequately. And I want the ability to be able to use those when that makes sense. That's part of making things simple. And because microservices can run on-premises as well as uh, in the cloud, then um, hopefully this will also change the way in which we think about integration on-premises. And, and that's a, another big theme here is, as what's happening with the cloud, the investments there also make their way on premises and uh, change the way in which we do integration there. And I think, um, and I'm taking this very much from what Microsoft have already said about their plans around integration on, on, on the Azure platform, that certainly on that platform and uh, where we will see platform level mediation microservices, this idea that mediation is such a common thing that it makes sense to provide these as it were out of the box. And uh, so almost in that sense of being platform services, they'll just be available there, but they will be microservices and we use them as we see appropriate and they will be fine grained services that we use for this approach. And um, uh, again, thinking of Azure and the forthcoming approaches in Azure, um, being able to use those services and create them through a browser interface and uh, decide you know what they're going to do so for example a browser interface that gives us a mapper and we can go in there and do simple mapping uh, between message types a full decoupling of business logic i think this is an important part of what we're looking at 
Um, and really, this is just the microservices story, the idea that um, uh, there will be far less emphasis, I think, in this new world on one big container to do everything, including all our service orchestration. And when it comes to business logic, we will be free to create that business logic as fine-grained services or whatever granularity makes sense to us as simple, straightforward REST services that we can host within this platform and we can use and reuse and share and do whatever we want to do without being beholden to some uh, uh, integration technology in order to manage all of that. But we still need um, uh, service orchestration. And again, with Azure in mind and what Microsoft have been talking about publicly around their plans for this, this idea that again, um, certainly on Azure, maybe other platforms, there will be because orchestration, forget about orchestration for integration purposes, but just orchestration of services. Um, and I'm not going to get into the choreography versus orchestration argument here, but the, the composition and um, orchestration of, of our microservices, that there will be platform level support for that. And uh, so we'll be able to exploit and use that again, um, what we've uh, seen uh, suggested in uh, a public conference at the end of last year was very much around a browser based approach for actually creating uh, that kind of, of technology. And then what I'll call routings, by which I simply mean that there will be no barriers now to how we route messages between mediation and business logic uh, on that sort of inside boundary. And I'm thinking very much here the biz talk place where we just have topics and subscriptions. We just have message queues and subscriptions. That's our one size fits all approach. Very, very strong approach. You can bend it to anything. It can deal with absolutely any, any requirement you throw at it. But there are many, many times when I just want to be able to call a service or I want to use some other kind of approach. And so I think routing by any means means that we will be very free to do direct calls, to integrate via data stores, even memory caches, certainly queues, topics and subscriptions already exist there, event hubs already exist on Azure, and any means that we actually wish to in a very um, uh, free world as far as that's concerned. Um, platform level monitoring and tracking, such an important part of integration is monitoring and tracking everything that you're doing. And I think you can see the way that this is sort of uh, working its, its way out already in Azure with good platform support and growing and evolving platform support for us from Microsoft and from third party vendors for um, uh, uh, monitoring and tracking to, to various levels of sophistication and really being able to just take the stuff that's already there in the platform and make use of that in terms of what we're doing. And I think we'll see a real emphasis on that. And even with uh, more sophisticated third party mediation containers or something like that, that they would plug into that kind of infrastructure and exploit what is already there. And, uh, and then obviously raising that again through browser-based tools and be able to monitor what we've got. Uh, a favoring of horizontal scaling. There's a little bit of a caveat over this one because I'm used on premises to a situation where we distribute services um, which may be um, fine grade services or, or, or coarse grade, whatever, but we distribute them freely across a very small number of machines because it's not free. It's all covered by quite expensive license. So we don't want too many machines in the, in the center. So we distribute over a constrained set of machines. So the technology, and I'm thinking biz talk here, the technology is all about exploiting those limited set of machines to the best ability, getting every last ounce of power from the CPU and whatever it may be, and really exploiting those machines for different workloads mixed together. But of course, the emphasis in the cloud is not on that at all. It's very much on, on horizontal scaling, just, just, just scale and scale, scale out uh, in terms of, of meeting the workloads that you actually have. And that's great. I have a few qualms about that um, with regards to how that's really going to work out. We will see. Firstly, it's, it certainly favors the vendor because every time you scale, you pay them more uh, for, for what you're running. Um, but also, you know, running multiple workloads together can be quite challenging. And some of those challenges don't go away just because you're moving to the cloud. So we will see how that goes, but obviously an emphasis on, on that. And of course, technology agnosticism, a really agnostic approach to technology and the ability for integration developers, just like any other developers, to choose and mix the tools, 
the frameworks, the microservices um, that already exist out there to, to be able to do that and to do that freely. I think we're going to see a lot of emphasis on Azure and the use of the marketplace as a place to, to sell uh, microservices, have a commercial uh, story around microservice-based uh, functionality, and lots of um, possibilities there for, for us to pick and mix, use whatever languages and whatever it is we want to do, mix things together to build integration solutions that really fit the actual business requirements, uh, be they the big top heavy enterprise application integration kind of requirements, or be they far more lightweight uh, integration requirements, and which will allow this democratization, allow developers on a much wider scale to play in this sandpit. No doubt, plenty of rope to hang themselves with, but nevertheless, to allow a much wider group of people into the integration world and to exploit this platform. So I just wanted to finish off my last two slides with a couple of slides um, uh, that I've just literally stolen, my apologies, I've just literally stolen from the Microsoft stack, um, but I thought it'd be worthwhile just, just finishing off with this to show how this fits in with what Microsoft have been talking about. So here's one uh, that was uh, uh, shown at a uh, recent uh, integration event uh, out in Redmond, and uh, it's uh, saying, well, uh, Microsoft's going to refactor their app platform with integration at the core. Isn't that wonderful? I love that. And uh, so we've got our microservices ecosystem with BizTalk microservices in it. And uh, so these are microservices that Microsoft are planning to provide as part of that ecosystem. And a cloud orchestration engine that Microsoft are planning to provide for the orchestration of microservices, together with everything else that we have on that uh, platform. You can see that it's based on containership, and Microsoft talking about that, and uh, using things like the API management and uh, web and mobile services and all the other goodness that's already there in Azure, uh, ready to go there. And Microsoft saying this will be available for both private clouds as well as public clouds. So they will be pushing this on-premises uh, at some point as well in the future and that kind of aspiration from their point of view. And the last side here, uh, because Connector Bingo is such an important part of the iPads world. So here's Microsoft doing Connector Bingo. And we have um, uh, you know, a, a growing set of connectors and the promise of many more than this and, and many more from, from partners uh, for that sort of uh, rapid connectivity story that seems to be one of the selling um, features of, of, of iPads. OK, well, that's me done. Um, I hope that's useful. I hope that sort of sets the scene um, uh, for uh, the next couple of years in terms of uh, where we're kind of going with integration. And uh, my slides are really not working because that last slide is the one where I've got my name and uh, uh, all that kind of information and something about the company. And it's coming up completely blank on my screen. But uh, there we go. So um, I work for a fantastic company in Hampshire and I've got a blog site, which is at geeks. Um, 